Hello, my name is Anna Greer um, and this lecture is part of the Bedrock series on human rights and climate change. On the 10th of July 2017, the Guardian newspaper in the United Kingdom published an article with this title, Just 100 Companies Responsible for 71% of Global Emissions, Study Says. So that's just 100 companies that have been the source of more than 70% of the world's greenhouse gases since 1988. And the report the article is talking about is the Carbon Majors Report, published by the Climate Accountability Institute. And the journalist writing the article, Tess Riley, quotes Pedro Faria, one of the report's authors, as saying this, While companies have a huge role to play in driving climate change, the barrier is the absolute tension between short-term profitability and the urgent need to reduce emissions. Now, of course, that makes sense. But I want to argue in this short lecture that the profit imperative is not the only dynamic in play. I want to take a broadly critical legal perspective, drawing on critical legal scholarship, to present a radically simplified picture of a convergence of scholarly arguments that expose legal and structural patterns complicit in the mess we're all in. My takeaway is at the heart of the trajectories feeding climate change and thoroughly central to law's complicity in the environmental destruction that is increasingly recognised as a breach of core human rights, there's a politics of legal disembodiment. Now that politics of legal disembodiment urgently needs calling out for what it amounts to, which is the practised, highly accomplished, deeply uneven distribution of life and death on this planet. The international legal order is not a place of justice and fairness, and it's not as if a few enormously powerful corporations and other privileged legal actors just need a bit of restraining by law. It's easy to think that a bit of legal reform, or a bit more legal accountability, or holding corporations accountable to human rights standards would make all the difference, but in reality, the picture is much more complicated than that. And I'm going to have to cut a lot of rather detailed arguments very short here, but I hope I can at least throw out a provocation or two. First, we need to note that the international legal order is locked into a fossil fuel corporation-driven economy, to a large degree by law itself. Dangerman and Schellnhumer, for example, have conducted extensive research showing that the structure of corporate law cuts off important feedback loops concerning climate change and the economy, locking the global economy into a fossil fuel foundation. The role of corporate law in that context, though, reflects wider structural tendencies in the international legal order. Corporate law is a symptom as well as a cause, if you like. And these wider structural tendencies challenge and limit the various legal and international initiatives attempting to address climate change and make it difficult also to address the human rights implications of climate injustice, environmental degradation and crimes of economic domination. These wider structural patterns also compromise human rights themselves. Baxi and others have pointed out very clearly that human rights have been colonised by global corporate capital and its interests to such an extent that serious sociological study shows the mutation of the international human rights paradigm into a trade-related, market-friendly paradigm of human rights. Human rights, then, as much as any other legal technique, struggle to confront crimes of economic domination. Crimes of economic domination are at the heart of our story here today. Anthony Angi, in his book Imperialism, Sovereignty and the Making of International Law, argues that the colonial suppression of third world peoples and the ambitions of global north states for natural resources to fuel their increasingly industrialised social order were key determinants of 19th century northern colonial and imperial expansionism, and that it is these colonising patterns that provide the foundations of international law. These industrial revolution driven patterns of plunder in the foundations of international law were themselves driven by highly uneven power relations. And the origins of climate change are likewise tied into this and were always an expression of deep inequality. Malman Hornburg, for example, points to the entanglements between colonisation, plunder, inequality and climate change when they argue that a scrutiny of the transition to fossil fuels in the 19th century in Britain shows the extent to which the historical origins of anthropogenic climate change were predicated on highly inequitable global processes right from the outset. They write that the rationale for investing in steam technology at this time 
was geared to the opportunities provided by the constellation of a largely depopulated New World, Afro-American slavery, the exploitation of British labour in factories and mines, and the global demand for inexpensive cotton cloth. They continue, Steam engines were not adopted by some natural-born deputies of the human species, but by the nature of social order of things, they could only be installed by the owners of the means of production. A tiny minority, even in Britain, this class of people comprised an infinitesimal fraction of the population of Homo sapiens in the early 19th century. Indeed, a clique of white British men literally pointed steam power as a weapon on sea and land, boats and rails, against the best part of humankind from the Niger Delta to the Yangtze Delta, from the Levant to Latin America. Capitalists in a small corner of the Western world invested in steam, laying the foundation stone for the fossil economy. At no moment did the species vote for it, either with feet or ballots. The colonising patterns that intensified in the 19th century, those ones that they were talking about, were visible earlier, at least as early as the 16th century, albeit not in an industrialised way, but they were earlier colonial enterprises um, for which the transnational corporation was central. And those patterns, the colonising patterns, are still visible now. The international legal order still systematically reflects the interests of the global north over those of the global south. But in doing so, it's simply reflecting the underlying purpose of international law that was developed in the context of the colonial and post-colonial eras and that purpose was and remains the promotion and protection of the economic interests of the north and as Simons has pointed out when newly independent states emerged from colonial rule and tried to assert their sovereignty and establish some control over their own natural resources northern states responded using legal doctrines such as state succession acquired rights contracts and consent to protect the interests of their corporate nationals in those newly decolonised states, and to resist the attempts to establish any kind of new international econo economic order in which those states would have sovereignty over their own resources. So as George Carlin, the famous comedian, once put it, the game is rigged, folks. Yep, the game is rigged. The international legal order is a structure that intimately reflects colonial impulses and the development of the fossil fuel global economy. So history is the place where ideology breaks cover, as Horvitz once famously wrote. And the history of law's development exposes an ideology of, an ideology of privilege circling around a particular construct of law's person. Now, not all non-lawyers will be aware that law can create persons at will as legal constructs that peg down a meeting point for legal relations like rights and duties. And there are various kinds of persons in law. But critical legal scholarship exposes a particular form of law's person that somehow always dominates, even in international human rights law. And this dominant template has a very particular form. It's intimately linked to the historical grant of civilizational priority and publicly sanctioned dominance to white, rational, property-owning European males at home, but also abroad, where classist, racist, gendered hierarchies dispossessed indigenous people. Now this particular form of person is also linked by critical accounts of human rights to the human rights universal, which is the supposedly universal figure of the human. Clear patterns of privilege and marginalisation circle around the idea of the European man of property and the kind of rationality that's imputed to that construct of a man. And that's a rationality cut off from the body by the famous mind-body split of Descartes and later Kant. And while many disciplines have rejected that mind-body split to varying degrees, for law, these assumptions around rationality remain absolutely fundamental, as Halewood and others have demonstrated. Law's rationality is a disembodied rationality, and this disembodied rationality only belongs, in archetypal terms, to one particular construct of the person in law. Yet this construct, which Nafine calls law's darling, for all its disembodiment, has a body smuggled in, and this body is the body of the white, rational, property-owning European man. Meanwhile, law's darling, who also in complex ways inhabits the human rights universal, sets up an entire world of others, others who are constructed as being less than fully rational, 
that is to say the non-male, the non-European, the non-property owning, and so on. But it's clear that not even the white rational property owning European man, once the unparalleled elite owner of the means of production and the driver of so-called civilization, not even such a man could ever be truly disembodied. Meanwhile, the corporation is an idiosyncratic legal form that has the kind of disembodied characteristics in law that no corporally specific human or animal body could ever possess. The corporation can move across jurisdictional boundaries for tax advantages or to avoid liability, and it can do it seamlessly in a world dedicated to the hypermobility of capital and shaped by corporate power. The disembodiment of transnational corporations gives them immense advantages, key among which is their slippery ability to evade accountability, including accountability for human rights abuses. Interestingly, there's plenty of scholarship pointing out how the corporation is based on the idealised vision of the white European, right, white European property-owning male in an idiosyncratic form, but the transnational corporation is surely the most extreme and successful elevation of this kind of elite disembodied legal privilege. Now, in the light of this very brief glimpse of the politics of legal disembodiment, perhaps it's unsurprising that law is unresponsive at a fundamental level to the ethical demands emerging from vulnerable biomateriality. After all, the disembodied master subject of law is, as Duzin has put it, a strangely mutilated and unencumbered entity. Crucially, it's entirely unlike the core victims of climate injustice. Women, children, the indigenous and other marginalised human groups can't fit this template. Such groups are systematically disadvantaged by the politics of legal disembodiment, even in international human rights law, where such marginalised groups have fought so hard for specific treaties in the name of their identities. And nor, emphatically, is law's darling a non-human animal or an ecosystem. Law's ultimate person, it turns out, has a very particular combination of relative disembodiment and a perfect match with capitalist ideology. It's the corporation, not the human being, that provides the ultimate person of law. And it's the corporation that is the ultimate beneficiary of the politics of legal disembodiment, to the great advantage of those hiding behind the corporate form as a cloaking device for the accumulation of immense anti-democratic anti levels of power. The implications of all this for environmental and climate justice considerations are significant. Turner has argued that the very design of law itself is fundamentally predisposed to environmental degradation and forms part of a dysfunctional global legal architecture which cannot achieve environmental sustainability. And the key to this is the legal structure and historical evolution of the business corporation. Human rights have no real answers for this. They too are radically affected by the rigging of the legal order. Baxi points out that long before slavery was abolished and before women got recognition for the right to contest and vote at elections, corporations had appropriated rights to personhood, claiming due process rights for regimes of property denied to human beings. The unfolding of modern human rights, he writes, is the story of near absoluteness of the right to property as a basic human right. So too is the narrative of colonisation and imperialism which began its career with the archetypal East India Company which ruled India for a century when corporate sovereignty was inaugurated. So in thinking about climate change and human rights it's useful and important I think to highlight the politics of legal disembodiment and the related systemic advantages of the transnational corporation in the international legal order. It seems vital to think about the implications of the patterned links between legal personhood, corporate privilege, historical elite European privilege and the fossil fuel driven process of colonisation that underlies the international order. All this has powerful implications for climate justice and for the role of human rights. None of us can assume, then, that we need just to see a few corporations held to account. The problem is far wider and deeper than that. What we witness is a tilted system, a logic working itself out, not just profit-driven opportunism. And at the heart of this is law's complicity. 
a politics of legal disembodiment is at work. So I was asked to leave you with three questions. So here they are. First, how might human rights in a more critical register play a role in building a new politics of compassion and a new politics of respect? Second, how can law be re-engineered to pay greater ethical attention to vulnerable materiality? And thirdly, is it time to re-engineer the corporation? Thank you for listening. Thank you for your time.